Chapter 9 of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Chapter 9 A Death in the Family. While Prince, tethered summarily outside the stable door with all his harness on, was trying in vain to understand this singular caprice on the part of Carpenter, Carpenter and the head of the house lifted Uncle Meshach's form and carried it into the hall. The women watched, ceasing their wild, useless questions. Into the breakfast room on the sofa, said John, breathing hard to the man. No, no, Leonora intervened. You'd better take him upstairs at once to Ethel and Millie's bedroom. The procession, undignified and yet impressive, came to a halt, and Carpenter, who was holding Meshach's feet, glanced with canine's anxiety from his master to his mistress. Well, look here, Nora, John began. Yes, father, upstairs, said Rose, cutting him short. Preoccupied with the cumbrous weight of Meshach's shoulders, John could not maintain the discussion. He hesitated, and then Carpenter moved towards the stairs. The small dangling body seemed to say, I am indifferent, but it is perhaps as well that you have done arguing. Run over to Dr. Hawley's and ask him to come across at once, John instructed Carpenter, when they had steered Uncle Meshach round the twist of the staircase, and insinuated him through a doorway, and laid him at length, in his overcoat and his muffler and his quaint boots, on Ethel's virginal bed. But has the doctor come home, Jack? Leonora inquired. Of course he has, said John. He drove up with Dane and they passed us at Shawport. Didn't you hear me call out to them? Oh, yes, she agreed. Then John, Atlas, but in his Ulster, and the women, hooded and shawled, drew round the bed, but Ethel and Millie stood at the foot. The inanimate form embarrassed them all, made them feel self-conscious and afraid to meet one another's eyes. Better loosen his things, said Leonora, and Rosie's fingers were instantly at work to help her. Uncle Meshach was white, rigid, and stone cold. The stiff, mired jaw was set. The eyes, wide open, looked upwards and strangely outwards in a fixed stare. And his audience thought, as they gazed in a sort of foolish astonishment at the puny, grotesque, and unfamiliar thing, Is this really Uncle Meshach? John lifted the wrist and felt for the pulse, but he could distinguish no beat, and he shook his head accordingly. Try the heart, mother, Rose suggested, and Leonora, after penetrating beneath garment after garment, placed her hand on Meshach's icy and tranquil breast, and she too shook her head. Then John, with an air of finality, took out his gold repeater, and when he had polished the glass, he held it to Uncle Meshach's parted lips. Can you see any moisture on it? he asked, taking it to the light, but none of them could detect the slightest dimness. I do wish the doctor would be quick, said Milly. Doctor will be no use, John remarked gruffly, returning to gaze again at the immovable face. Except for an inquest, he added. I think someone had better walk down to Church Street at once and tell Aunt Hannah that Uncle is here, said Leonora. Perhaps she is ill. Anyhow, she'll be very anxious. But she faltered before the complicated problem. Rose, Go and wake Bessie and ask her if Uncle called here during the evening and tell her to get up at once and light the gas stove and put some water on to boil and then to light a fire here. And who's to go to Church Street? John asked quickly. Leonora looked for an instant at Rose as the girl left the room. He felt that on such an occasion she could more easily spare Ethel's sweet eagerness to help than Rose's almost sinister self-possession. Ethel and Millie, she said promptly, at least they can run on first. And be very careful what you say to Aunt Hannah, my dears. And one of you must hurry back at once, in any case, by the road, not by the fields, and tell us what has happened. Rose came in to say that Bessie and the other servants had seen nothing of Uncle Meshach, and that they were all three getting up, and then she disappeared into the kitchen. Ethel and Millie departed, a little scared, a little regretful, but inspirited by the dreadful charm and fascination of the whole inexplicable adventure. Aunt Hannah's had another attack, depend on it, said John. That's it. I hope not, Leonora murmured perfunctorily. Now that she had broken the spell of futile inactivity which the discovery of Uncle Bishak's body seemed for a few dire moments to have laid upon them, she was more at ease. I fancy you'd better go down there yourself as soon as the doctor's been, John continued. You're probably more likely to be useful there than here. What do you think? She looked at him under her eyelids, saying nothing, and reading all his mind. He had obstinately determined that Uncle Meshach was dead, 
he was striving to conceal both his satisfaction on that account and his rapidly growing anxiety as to the condition of Aunt Hannah. His terrible lack of frankness, that instinct for the devious and the underhand which governed his entire existence, struck her afresh and seemed to devastate her heart. She felt that she could not have tolerated in her husband any vice with less effort than that one vice which was specially his, that vice so contemptible and odious, so destructive of every noble and generous sentiment. A silent, measured indignation fed itself on almost nothing, on a mere word, a mere inflection of his voice, a single transient gleam of his guilty eye. And though she was right by an early intuition, John, could he have seen into her soul, might have been excused for demanding, What have I said? What have I done to deserve this scorn? Rose returned, bearing materials for a fire. She had changed her liberty dress for the dark, severe frock of her studious hours, and she had an irritating air of being perfectly equal to the occasion. John, having thrown off his ulster, endeavoured to assist her in lighting the fire. But she at once proved to him that his incapacity was a hindrance to her. Whereupon he wondered what in the name of goodness Carpenter and the Doctor were doing to be so long. Leonora began to tidy the room, which bore witness to the regardless frenzy of anticipation with which occupants had cast aside the soiled commonplaces of life six hours before. But look, Rose cried suddenly, examining Uncle Meshach anew after the fire was lighted. What? John and Leonora demanded together, rushing to the bed. His lips weren't like that, the girl asserted with eagerness. All three gazed long at the impassive face. Of course they were, said John, coldly discouraging. Leonora made no remark. The unblinking eyes of Uncle Meshach had continued to stare upwards and outwards indifferently, interested in the ceiling. Outside could be heard the creaking of stairs and the affrighted whisper of the maids as they descended in déshabillé from their attics at the bidding of this unconscious, cynical and sardonic enigma on the bed. His heart is beating faintly. Old Dr. Hawley dropped the antique stethoscope back into the pocket of his tight dress coat and, still bending over Uncle Meshach, but turning slightly towards John and Leonora, smiled with all his invincible jollity. Is it by Jove? John exclaimed. You thought he was dead? said the doctor, beaming. Leonora nodded. Well, he isn't, the doctor announced with curt cheerfulness. That's good, said John. But I don't think he can get over it, the doctor concluded with undiminished brightness, his eyes twinkling. While he spoke, he was busy with the hot water and the cloths which Leonora and Rose had produced immediately upon demand. In a few minutes, Uncle Meshach was covered almost from head to foot with cloths drenched in hot mustard and water. He had hot water bags under his arms, and he was swathed in a huge blanket. There, said the rotund doctor, you must keep that up, and I'll send a stimulant at once. I can't stop now, not another minute. I was called to an obstetric case just as I started out. I'll come back the moment I'm free. What is this this thing? John inquired. What is it? The doctor repeated genially. I'll tell you what it is. Put your nose there. He indicated Uncle Meshach's mouth. Do you notice that a maniacal smell? That's due to uremia, a sequel of Bright's disease. Bright's disease? John muttered. Bright's disease, affirmed the doctor, dwelling on the famous and striking syllables. Your uncle is a typical instance of the man who has never been ill in his life. He walks up a little slope or up some steps to a friend's house, and just as he is lifting his hand to the knocker, he has a convulsion and falls down unconscious. That's Bright's disease. Never been ill in his life, not so far as he knew. Nearly all you Myatts have weak kidneys. Do you remember your great-uncle Ebenezer? You sent down to Miss Myatt, you say? Good. Perhaps he was lying on your steps for two or three hours. He may pull round. He may. He must hope so. The doctor put on his overcoat and his cap with the ear flaps, and after a final glance at the patient and a friendly reassuring smile at Leonora, he went slowly to the door. Girth and good humour and funny stories had something to do with his great reputation in Bursley and Hillport, but he possessed shrewdness and sagacity. He belonged to a dynasty of doctors, and he was deeply versed in the social traditions of the dialect. Men consulted him because their grandfathers had consulted his father, and because there had always been a Dr. Hawley in Bursley, and because he was acquainted with the pathological details of their ancestral history on both sides of the heart. His patients, indeed, were not individuals, but families. There were cleverer doctors in the place, 
doctors of more refined appearance and manners, doctors less monotonously and loudly gay. But old Hawley, with his knowledge of pedigrees and his unique instinctive sympathy with the idiosyncrasies of local character, could hold his own against the most assertive young MD that ever came out of Edinburgh to monopolise the five towns. Can you send someone round with me for the medicine? he asked in the doorway. Happen you'll come yourself, John? There was a momentary hesitation. I'll come, Doctor, said Rose, and then you can give me all your instructions. Mother must stay here. She completely ignored her father. Do, my dear, come by all means. And the doctor beamed again suddenly with a maximum of cheerfulness. Meshach had given no sign of life. His eyes, staring upwards and outwards, were still unchangeably fixed on the same portion of the ceiling. He ignored equally the nonchalant and expert attention to the doctor, the false solicitude of John, Leonora's passionate anxiety, and Rose's calm self-confidence. He treated the fermentations with the apathy which might have been expected from a man who for fifty years had been accustomed to receive the meek, skilled service of women in august silence. One could almost have detected in those eyes a glassy and profound secret amusement at the disturbance which he had caused. A humorous appreciation of all the fuss. The maids with their hair down their backs bending and whispering over a stove. Ethel and Millie trudging scared through the nocturnal streets. Rose talking with demure excitement to old Hawley in his aromatic surgery. John officiously carrying kettles to and fro and issuing orders to Bessie on the passage. Leonora cast violently out of one whirlpool into another, and some unknown expectant terrified pair, wondering why the doctor had been warned months before to thus culpably neglect their urgent summons. As he lay there so grim and derisive and solitary, so fatigued with days and nights, so used up, so steeped in experience and so contemptuously unconcerned, he somehow baffled all the efforts of blankets, cloths and bags, to make his miserable frame look ridiculous. He had a majesty which subdued his surroundings. And in this room, hitherto sacred to the charming mistress of girlhood, his cadaverous presence forced the skirts and petticoats on Millie's bed, and the disordered apparatus on the dressing table, and the scented soaps on the washstand, and the row of tiny boots and shoes which Leonora had arranged near the wardrobe, to apologise pathetically and wistfully for their very existence. Is that enough, Mustard? he asked hard idly. Yes, said Leonora. She realised, not in the least because he had asked a banal question about Mustard, that he was perfectly insensible to all spiritual significances. She had been aware of it for many years, yet the fact touched her now more sharply than ever. It seemed to her that she must cry out in a long mournful cry. Can't you see? Can't you feel? And once again her husband might justifiably have demanded, what have I done this time? I wish one of those girls would come back from Church Street, he burst out, frowning. There he are. He became excited as he listened to light, rapid footsteps on the stair. But it was Rose who entered. Here's the medicine, Mother, said Rose eagerly. She was flushed and running. It's chloric ether and nitrate of potash, a highly diffusible stimulant, and there's a chance that sooner or later it may put him into a perspiration. But it would be worse than useless if the hot applications aren't kept up, the doctor said. You must raise his head and give it to him in a spoon in very small doses. And then Meshach impassively submitted to the hand of his head and his mouth. He gurgled faintly in accepting the medicine. And soon his temples and the corners of his lips showed a very slight perspiration. But though the doses were repeated and the fermentations assiduously maintained, no further result occurred save that Meshach's eyes, according to the shifting of his head, perused new portions of the ceiling. As the futile minutes passed, John grew more and more restless. He was obliged to, to admit to himself that Uncle Meshach was not dead, but he felt absolutely sure that he would never revive. And not the doctor said as much. And he wanted desperately to hear that Aunt Hannah still lived, and to take every measure of precaution for her continuance in this world. The whole of his future might depend upon the hazard of the next hour. Look here, Nora, he said protestingly, while Rose was on one of her journeys to the kitchen. Evidently not much use your stopping here, whereas there's no knowing what hasn't happened down at Church Street. Do you mean you wish me to go down there? she asked coldly. Well, I leave it to your common sense, he retorted. 
Rose appeared. Your father thinks I ought to go down to Church Street, said Leonora. What, and leave uncle? Rose added nothing to this question, but proceeded with her task. Certainly, John insisted. Leonora was conscious of an acute resentment against her husband. The idea of her leaving Uncle Meshach at such a crisis seemed to her to be positively wicked. Had not John heard what Rose said to the doctor? Mother must stay here. Had he not heard that? But of course he desired that Uncle Meshach should die. Yes, every word, every gesture of his in the sick room was an involuntary expression of that desire. Why don't you go yourself, father? Rose demanded of him bluntly after a pause. Simply because if there is any illness, I shouldn't be any use. John glared at his daughter. Then, quite suddenly, Leonor thought how vain, how pitiful, how unseemly were these acrimonious conflicts of opinion in presence of the strange and awe-inspiring riddle in the blanket. An impulse seized her to give way, and she found a dozen reasons why she should desert Uncle Meshach for Aunt Hannah. Can you manage? she asked Rose doubtfully. Oh, yes, mother, we can manage, answered Rose with an exasperating manufactured sweetness of tone. Tell Carpenter to put the horse in, John suggested. I expect he's waiting about in the kitchen. No, said Leonora. I'll pin my skirt up and walk. I shall be halfway there before he's ready to start. When Leonora had departed, John redoubled his activity as a nurse. There's no object in changing the cloths as often as that, said Rose but his suspense forbade him to keep still. Rose annoyed him excessively, and the nervous energy which should have helped towards self-control was expended in concealing that annoyance. He felt as though he should go mad unless something decisive happened very soon. To his surprise, just after the whole clock, which was always kept half an hour fast, had sounded three through the dark passages of the apprehensive house, Rose left the room. He was alone with what remained of Uncle Meshach. He moved the blanket and touched the cloth which lay on Meshach's heart. Not too hot, that, he said aloud. Taking the cloth, he walked to the fire, where was a large saucepan full of nearly boiling water. He picked up the lid of the saucepan, dropped it, crossed over to the washstand with a brusque movement, and plunged the cloth into the cold water of the ewer. Holding it there, he turned and gazed in a sort of abstract meditation at Uncle Meshach, who steadily ignored him. He was possessed by a genuine feeling of righteous indignation against his uncle. He drew the cloth from a ewer, squeezed it a little, and approached the bed again. And as he stood over Meshach with the cloth in his hand, he saw his wife in the doorway. He knew in an instant that his own face had frightened her and prevented her from saying what she was about to say. How you startled me, Nora! he exclaimed with his surpassing genius for escaping from an apparently fatal situation. She went up to the bed. Don't keep Uncle uncovered like that, she said. Put it on. She took the cloth from his hand. Why, she cried, it's like ice. What on earth are you doing? Where's Rose? I, I, I was just taking it off, he replied. What about Aunt? I met the girls down the road, she said. Your aunt is dead. A few minutes later, Uncle Meshach's rigid frame suffered a convulsion. The whole surface of his skin sweated abundantly. His eyes wavered, closed and opened again. His mouth made the motion of swallowing. He had come back from unconsciousness. He was no longer an enigma, wrapped in supercilious and inflexible calm, but a sick, shriveled little man, so pitiably prostrate that his condition drew the sympathy out of Leonora with a sharp, violent pain as very cold metal burns the fingers. He could not even whisper. He could only look. Soon afterwards, Dr. Hawley returned, explaining that the anxiety of a husband about to be a father had caught him too soon by several hours. The doctor, who had been informed of Aunt Hannah's death as he entered the house, said at once, on seeing him, that Uncle Meshach had had a marvellous escape. Then, when he had succoured the patient further, he turned, rather formidably, Leonora. I want to speak to you, he said. He led her out of the room, leaving Rose, Ethel and John in charge of Meshach. What is it, Doctor? she asked him plaintively on the landing. Which is your bedroom? Show me, he demanded. She opened a door and they both went in. I'll light the gas, he said, doing so. 
And now, he proceeded, you'll kindly retire to bed instantly. Mr. Myatt is out of danger. He smiled warmly, just as he had smiled when he predicted that Meshach would probably not recover. But, Doctor, Leonor protested, instantly, he said, forcing her gently onto the sofa at the foot of the two beds. But someone ought to go down to Church Street to look after things, he began. Church Street can wait. There's no hurry at Church Street now. My uncle hasn't been told yet. I'm not at all overtired, Doctor. Yes, Mother dear, you are, and you must do as the Doctor orders. It was Ethel who had come into the room. She touched Leonora's arm caressingly. And where are you girls to sleep? The spare room isn't... Oh, Mother, let's listen to her, Doctor, said Ethel, stroking her mother's hand, as though she and the Doctor were two old and sage persons, and Leonora was a small child. They think I'm ill. They think I'm going to collapse. The idea struck her suddenly. But I'm not. I'm quite well, and my brain is perfectly clear. And anyhow, I'm sure I can't sleep. She said aloud, It wouldn't be any use. I shouldn't sleep. And I'll attend to that. I'll attend to that. The doctor laughed. Ethel, help your mother to bed. He departed. This is really most absurd, Leonora reflected. It's ridiculous. Ah, well, I'm only doing it to oblige them. Before she was entirely undressed, Rose entered with a powder and a white paper and a glass of hot milk. You are to swallow this, mother, and then drink this. Here, Eth, hold the glass a second. And Leonora accepted the powder from Rose and the milk from Ethel as they stood side by side in front of her. Great waves seemed to surge through her brain. In walking to the bed, she saw herself all white in the mirror of the wardrobe. My face looks as if it was covered with flour. Said to Ethel with a short laugh. It did not occur to her that she was pale. Don't forget to. She had forgotten what Ethel was not to forget. Her head reeled as it lay firmly on the pillow. The waves were waves of sound now. They developed into a rhythm, a tune. She had barely time to discover that the tune was the Blue Danny Waltz and that she was dancing. And the whole world came to an end. She awoke to feel the radiant influence of the afternoon sun through the green blind. Impregnated with a delicious languor, she slowly stretched out her arms and, lifting her head, gazed first at the intricate tracery of the lace on her silk nightgown and then into the silent, dreamy spaces of the room. Everything was in perfect order. She guessed that Ethel must have trod softly to make it tidy before leaving her hours ago. John's bed was turned down and his pyjamas laid out with all Bessie's accustomed precision. Presently she noticed on her night table a sheet of note paper on which had been written in pencil in large letters, Ring the bell before getting up. She could not be sure whether the hand was Ethel's or Rosie's. Oh, she thought, how good my girls are. She was quite well, quite restored, and slightly hungry. But she was also calm, content, ready to commence existence anew. I suppose I'd better humour them, she murmured, as she rang the bell. Bessie entered. The treasure was irreproachably neat and prim in her black and white. What time is it, Bessie? Leonora inquired. It's straight up three, ma'am. I must have slept for eleven hours. How is Mr. Meyer going on? Bessie dropped her hands and smiled benevolently. Oh, he's much better, ma'am. And when the doctor told him about poor Miss Meyer, ma'am, he just said the funeral must be on Saturday, because he didn't like Sunday funerals, and it wouldn't do to wait till Monday. He didn't say nothing else, and he keeps on telling us he should be well enough to go to the funeral, and he sent Master down to guests in St. Luke's Square to order it, and the hearse is to have two horses, but not the coaches, ma'am. He's asleep just now, ma'am, and I'm watching him, but Miss Rose is resting on Miss Minnie's bed in case, so I can come in here for a minute or two. He told the doctor and Master that Miss Meyer was took with one of them attacks at half past eleven o'clock, and he went for Dr. Adams, as lives at the top of Old Castle Street. Dr. Adams wasn't in, and then he, then he saw a cab. It must have been coming from the ball, ma'am. But Mr. Meyer didn't know there was any ball, and he drove up to Hillport for Dr. Hawley, him being the family doctor. And then he said he felt bad back, and he thought he'd come here and send Master across the way for Dr. Hawley. And he got out of the cab and paid the cabman, and then he don't remember no more. Wasn't it dreadful, ma'am? I don't believe he rightly knew what he was doing, the poor old gentleman. Here on listen. Where are Miss Ethel and Miss Millie? she asked. Master said they was to go to Old Castle to order morning, ma'am. They've but just gone. 
and master said he should be back himself about six. He never slept a wink, ma'am, not even sat down. He just had his bath, and Miss Ethel crept in here for his clothes. And have you been to bed, Bessie? Me? No, ma'am. What should I go to bed for? I'm as well as well, ma'am. Miss Millie slept in Miss Rose's bedroom for a bit, and Miss Ethel on the sofa in the drawing room, not as you might call that sleepy. Miss Rose said you was to have some tea before you got up, ma'am. Shall I tell Cook to get it now? I really think I should prefer to have it downstairs, Bessie, thank you, said dear Mama. Very well, ma'am. But Miss Rose said, yes, but I will have it downstairs, in three quarters of an hour, say. Very well, ma'am. Now, is there anything else I can do for you, ma'am? While dressing, very placidly and deliberately, and while thinking upon all the multitudinous things that seemed to have happened in her world during her long slumber, Leonora dwelt too upon the extraordinary loving kindness of this Harling, who got twenty pounds a year, half a day a week, and a day a month. On the first of every month, Leonora handed to Bessie one paltry sovereign, thirteen shillings, and the odd fourpence in coppers. She wondered fancifully if she would have the effrontery to requite the girl in coin on the next payday, and she was filled with a sense of the goodness of humanity. And then there crossed her mind the recollection that she had caught John in a wicked act on the previous night. Yes, he had not imposed on her for a moment. But she perceived clearly now that murder had been in his heart. She was not appalled, nor desolated. She thought, so that is murder, that little thing, that thing over in a minute. It appeared to her that murder in the concrete was less dreadful than murder in the abstract, far less horrible than the strident sound of the word on the lips of a newsboy, or the look of it in the signal. She felt dimly that she ought to be shocked, unnerved, terrified at the prospect of living, eating and sleeping with a man who had meant to kill. But she could not summon these sensations. She merely experienced a kind of pity for John. She put the episode away from her as being closed, accidental and unimportant. Uncle Bishak was alive. A few minutes before four o'clock she went quietly into the sick room. Bessie, sitting upright between the beds, put her finger to her lips. Uncle Meshach was asleep on Ethel's bed, and on the other bed lay Rose, also asleep, stretched in a negligent attitude, but fully dressed and wearing an old black frock that was too tight for her. The fire burned brightly. Tea is ready in the drawing room, ma'am, Bessie whispered, and Mr. Tremlow has just called. He's waiting to see you. So you know what has happened to us? Yes, he said, I met your husband on St. Luke's Square, but I heard something before that. At one o'clock a man told me at Knipe Station that Mr. Myatt had cut his throat on your doorstep. I didn't believe it. So I called up Twemlow and Stanway over the phone and got on to the fact. What things people say, she exclaimed. I guess you've stood it very well, he remarked, gazing at her, as with quick, sure movements of her grassal hands she poured out the tea. Ah! He murmured, flushing. They sent me to bed. I've only just got up. I know exactly when you went to bed, he smiled. His tone filled her with satisfaction. She had hoped and expected that he would behave naturally, that he would not adopt the desolating attitude of gloom prescribed by convention for sympathisers with the bereaved, and she was not disappointed. He spoke with an easy and cheerful sincerity and she was exquisitely conscious of the flattery implied in that simple, direct candour, which seemed to, to say to her, You and I have no need of convention. We understand each other. Perhaps never in her life, not even in the wonderful felicities of girlhood, had Leonora been more peacefully content than during those moments of calm, succeeding stress, as she met Arthur's eyes in the intimacy of a fraternal confidence. The large room was so tranquil, curtains so white, and the sunlight so malignant in the caress of its amber horizontal ray. Rose lay asleep upstairs. Ethel and Millicent were at Old Castle. John would not return for two hours. And she and Arthur were alone together in the middle of the long, quiet chamber, talking quietly. She was happy. She had no fear, neither for herself nor for him. As innocent as Rose, and more innocent than Ethel. She now regarded the feverish experience of the dance as accidental, a thing to be forgotten, an episode of which the repetition was merely to be avoided. Death, 
and the fear of death had come suddenly, written over its record in the page of existence. Her present sanity and calmness, her mild bliss and self-control, these were to last, these were the real symptoms of her condition, and of Arthur's condition. No, the memory of the ball did not trouble her. It had not troubled her since she awoke after the sedative. She had entered the drawing-room without a qualm, and the instant of their meeting, anticipated on the previous night as much in terror as in joy, had passed equably and serenely. Relying on his strength and exulting in her own, she had given him her hand, and he had taken it, and that was all. She knew her native faults. She knew that she had the precious and rare gift of common sense, and she was perfectly convinced that this common sense, which had never long deserted her in the past, could never permanently desert her in the future. She imagined that nothing was stronger than common sense. She had small suspicion that in their noblest hours men and women have invariably despised common sense and trampled it underfoot as the most contemptible of human attributes. Therefore, she was content, unalarmed. And she found pleasure even in trifles, as, for example, the maid had set two cups and saucers, and two only. Duality struck her as delicious. She looked close at Arthur's sagacious, shrewd, and kindly face, with a heavy clipped moustache and a bluish chin, and those grey hairs at the sides of the forehead. We belong to the same generation, he and I, she thought, eating bread and butter and relish. We are not so very old, after all. Aunt Hannah was incomparably older, ripe for death. Who could be profoundly moved by that unimportant, that trivial demise? She felt very sorry for Uncle Meshach, but no more than that. Such sentiments may have the appearance of callousness, but they were the authentic sentiments of Leonora, and Leonora was not callous. The financial aspect of Aunt Hannah's death, as it affected John and herself and the girls and their home, did not disturb her. He was removed far above finance, far above any preoccupation about the latter years, and she sat talking quietly and blissfully with Arthur in the drawing room. Yes, she was telling him, it was just opposite the Clayton Vernons that I met them. Where the elm trees spread over the road? he questioned. She nodded, pleased by his minute interest in her narrative and by his knowledge of the neighbourhood. I saw them both a long way off, walking quickly, under a gas lamp. That is very curious, but although I was so anxious to know what had happened, I couldn't go on to meet them. I was obliged to wait until they came up. And they didn't notice me at first, and then Ethel shrieked out, Oh, it's Mother! And Milly said, Aunt Hannah's dead, Mother. Is Uncle Meshach dead? I can't understand how queer I felt. I felt as if Milly would go on asking and asking. Is Father dead? Is Bessie dead? Is Bran dead? Are you dead? I know, he said reflectively. She guessed that he envied her the strange nocturnal adventure, and her secret pride in the adventure, which hitherto she had endeavoured to suppress, suddenly became open and legitimate. She allowed her face to disclose the thought. You see that I too have lived through crises, and that I can appreciate how wonderful they are. And she proceeded to give him all the details of Aunt Hannah's death, as she had learned them from Ethel and Minnie during the walk home through sleepy Hillport. How the serpent had grown alarmed and had called a neighbour by breaking a bedroom window with a broomstick, leaning from Aunt Hannah's window, and how the neighbour's eldest boy had run for Dr Adams and had caught him in the street just as he was returning home, and how Aunt Hannah was gone before the boy came back with Dr Adams, and how no one could guess what had happened to Uncle Meshach, and no one could suggest what to do until Ethel and Minnie knocked at the door. Isn't it all strange? Don't you think it's strange? Leonora demanded. No, he said. It seems strange, but it isn't really. Such things are always happening. Are they? He spoke naively with a girlish inflection and a girlish gesture. Well, of course. He smiled gravely and yet humorously. And his eyes said, What a charming, simple thing you are. And you liked to think of his superiority over her inexperience, knowledge, imperturbability, breadth of view, and all those kindred qualities which women give to the men they admire. They could not talk further on the subject. 
Oh, by the way, uh, how's your foot? My foot? Yes, you, you heard it last night, didn't you, after I'd gone? He'd completely forgotten the trifling fiction until it thus rather startlingly reappeared on his lips. She might easily have let it die naturally had she chosen. She could not choose. She had a whim to kill it violently, romantically. No, she said, I didn't hurt him. It was your husband was telling me. He went on joyously and fearful. Someone asked me to dance after after the Blue Danube, and I, I didn't want to. I couldn't. And so I said I'd hurt my foot. It was just one of those things that one says, you know. He was embarrassed. He had no remark ready. But to preserve appearances, he lowered the corners of his lips and glanced at the copper tea kettle through half-closed eyes, feigning to suppress a private amusement. He was quite aware, however, that she had embarrassed him. And just as a minute earlier she had liked him for his lordly, masculine, philosophic superiority, so now she liked him for that youthful embarrassment. He felt that all men were equally childlike to women, that the most adorable were the most childlike. How little you understand, after all, he said. The boy, I unlatched the door, and you dared not push it open. You were afraid of committing an indiscretion. But I will guide and protect you, and protect us both. This was the woman who, half an hour ago, had been exulting in the adequacy of her common sense. Innocent and enchanting creature, with the rashness of innocence. I guess I couldn't dance again after the Blue Danube either, he said at length, boldly. She made no answer. Perhaps she was a little intimidated, but she looked at him with eyes and lips full of latent vivacity. That was why I left, he finished firmly. There was in his tone a hint of that engaging and piquant antagonism which springs up between lovers and dies away. He had the air of telling her that since she had invited a confession, he was welcome to it. She retreated, still admiring, and said evenly that the ball had been a great success. Soon afterwards, Ethel and Millie unexpectedly entered the room. They had put on the formal aspect of dejection which they deemed proper for them, but on perceiving that their elders were talking quite naturally, they at once abandoned constraints and became natural too. From the sight of their unaffected pleasure in seeing Arthur Twemlow again, Leonora drew further sustenance for her mood of serene content. Just fancy, Mr Twemlow, Mr said burst out, we walked all the way to Earl Castle, and we never thought, and no one reminded us. Father's fault, really. What is father's fault, really? It's Thursday afternoon and the shops were all shut. We shall have to go tomorrow morning. Ah, he said, the stores don't shut on Thursday afternoon in New York. Mother will be able to come with us tomorrow morning, said Ethel, and approaching Leonora, she asked, Are you all right, mother? This simple, familiar conversation, and the free movements of the girls, and the graver suavity of Arthur and herself, seemed to Leonora to constitute a picture, a scene of mysterious and profound charm. Arthur rose to depart. The girls wished him to stay, but Leonora did not support them. In a house where an aged relative lay ill, and that relative so pathetically bereaved, it was not meet that a visitor should remain too long. Immediately he had gone, she began to anticipate their next meeting. The eagerness of that anticipation surprised her. Moreover, the environment of her life closed quickly round her. She could not ignore it. She demanded of herself what was Arthur's excuse for calling, and how was it that she should be so happy in the midst of woe and death? Her joyous confidence was shaken. Feeling that on such a day she ought to have been something other than a delicate chatelaine, idly dispensing tea in a drawing room, she went upstairs, determined to find some useful activity. The light was falling in the sick room, and the fire shone brighter. Bessie had disappeared and Rose sat in her place. Uncle Meshach still slept. Have you had a good rest, my dear? he whispered, kissing Rose fondly. You'd better go downstairs. I've had some tea, and I'll take charge here now. Very well, the girl assented, yawning. Who's that just gone? Mr Twemlow. Oh, mother, Rose exclaimed in anger disappointment. 
Why didn't someone tell me he was here? The cortege will move at 2.15, said the morning invitation cards. And on Saturday, at two o'clock, Uncle Meshach, dressed in deep black, sat on a cane chair against the wall of the bedroom of his late sister. He had not been able to conceive Hannah's funeral without himself as chief mourner, and therefore he had accomplished his own recovery in the amazing period of fifty hours. And in addition to accomplishing his recovery, he had given an uninterrupted series of the most minute commands concerning the arrangements for the obsequies. Protests had been utterly useless. It will kill him, said Leonora to the doctor, as Meshach, risen straight out of bed, was getting into a cab at Hillport that morning to drive to Church Street. It may, Lord Hawley answered. And what can one do? Smiling, first at Meshach and then at Leonora, the doctor had joined his aged patient in the cab, and they'd gone off together. Next to the cane chair was Hannah's mahogany bed, which had been stripped. On the bed lay a massive oaken coffin, and accurately fitted into the coffin lay the withered remains of Meshach's slave. The prim and spotless bedroom, with its chest of drawers, its small glass, its three-cornered wardrobe, its narrow washstand, its odd bonnet boxes, its trunk, its skirts hung inside out behind the door, its Bible with the spectacle case on it, its texts, its miniature portraits, its samplers framed in a maple, and its engraving of the infant John Wesley being saved from the fire at Epworth Vicarage, framed in gold, was eloquent of the habits of the woman who had used it, without ambition, without repining, and without hope, save an everlasting hope, for more than fifty years. Into this room, obedient to the rigid etiquette of an old-fashioned five-towns funeral, every person asked to the burial was bound to come, in order to take a last look at the departed, and to offer a few words of sympathy to the chief mourner. As they entered, Stanley, David Dane, Fred Riley, Dr Hawley, Leonora, the servant, and lastly Arthur Twemlow, unwillingly desecrating the almost secular modesty of the town chamber, Meshach received them one by one with calmness, with detachment, with the air of the curator of the museum. Here she is, as Meehan indicated, that is to say what's left, gaze your fill, Beyond a monotonous, thank ye, thank ye, response to expressions of sympathy for him and of appreciation of Hannah's manifold excellences, he made no remarks to anyone except Leonora and Arthur Tremlow. Has that ginger wine come? he asked Leonora anxiously. The feast after the sepulture was as important and as strictly controlled by etiquette as the lying in state. Leonora, who had charge of the meal, was able to keep him in a permit. I'm glad as you've come, he said to Tremblow. I'd a fancy for you to see her again as soon as they told me you was back. That makes a good corpse, eh? Tremblow agreed. Do die suddenly, that's the best, he murmured awkwardly. He did not know what to say. I was a good sister, a good sister. He shall pronounce with an emotion which was doubtless genuine and profound, but which superficially resembled that of an examiner awarding pass marks to a pupil. By the way, Twemlow, he added, as Arthur was leaving the room, just ever thrash that business out with our John. I've been thinking over a lot of things when I fast a bit up yon. Arthur stared at him. Thou knowest what I mean, continued Meshach, putting his thin, tremulous hand on the edge of the coffin in order to rise from the chair. Oh, yes, Arthur replied. I know. I, I haven't settled it yet. I, I haven't had time. I should have thought thou'd had time enough, lad, said Meshach. Then the undertaker's men adjusted the lid of the coffin, hiding Aunt Hannah's face, and screwed in the eight brass screws and clumped down the dark stairs with their burden, and so across the pavement between two rows of sluttish sightseers to the hearse. Uncle Meshach, with the aid only of his stick, entered the first coach. John Stanway and Fred Riley, the rules of precedence were thus inflexible, occupied the second, and Arthur Tremlow, with the family lawyer and the family doctor, took the third. Leonora remained in the house with the servant to spread the feast. The church was barely four hundred yards away, and in less than half an hour they were all in the house again, all save Aunt Hannah, who had already, in the vault of the Myatts, 
pass the first five minutes of the tedium of waiting for the day of judgment. And now, as they gather round the fish, the fowl, the ham, the cakes, the preserves, the tea, the wines, and the spirits, Etiquette demanded that they should be cheerful, should show resignation to the will of heaven, and should eat heartily. And although the rapid ticking clock on the mantelpiece in the parlour pointed only to a little better than three o'clock, they were obliged to eat heartily, for fear of giving pain to Uncle Bichet. To drink much was not essential, but nothing could have excused abstention from the solid fare. The repast, actively conducted by the morning host, was not finished until nearly half past four. Then Tremlow and the doctor said that they must leave. Nay, nay, he shall complain. There's the will to be read. It's right and proper as all the guests should hear the will. It'll take no but a few minutes. The enfeebled old man talked more and more the dialect which his father and mother had talked over his cradle. Better without us, for old friend, the doctor said jauntily. Besides, my patience. By dint of blithe obstinacy, he managed to get away, and also to recover the retreat of Tremlow. I shall call in a day or two, said Arthur to Uncle Bichek as they shook hands. I call and see the old ruin, Bichek replied, and dropping back into his chair. Now, Dane, he ordered. David Dane drew a long white envelope from his breast pocket. This is the last will and testament of me, Hannah Margaret Myatt. The lawyer began to read quickly in his thick voice. Of Church Street, Bursley, in the county of Stafford, Spinster, I commit my body to the grave and my soul to God in the sure hope of a blessed resurrection through my Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. I bequeath ten pounds each to my dear nephew, John Stanway, and to his wife, Leonora, to purchase mourning at my decease, and five pounds each for the same purpose to my dear great-nephew, Frederick Wellington Riley, and to my great-nieces, Ethel Rosalies and Millicent Stanway, and to any other children of the said John and Leonora Stanway, should they have such and should such the children survive me. Uh, this will is dated twelve years ago, the lawyer stopped to explain. He continued, I further bequeath to my great-nephew, Frederick Wellington Riley, the sum of two hundred and fifty pounds. Something for you there, Frederick Wellington Riley, exclaimed Stanway in a frigid tone, biting his thumb and looking up at the ceiling. Riley blushed. He scarcely spoke to the meal, and he did not break his silence now. With much verbiage, the will proceeded to state that the testatrix left the residue of her private savings to Meshach, to dispose of absolutely according to his own discretion, in case he should survive her, and that in case she should survive him, she left her private savings and the whole of her estate of which she and Meshach were joint tenants to John Stanley. There is a short codicil, Dane added, which revokes the legacy of £250 to Mr. Riley in case Mr. Myatt should survive the testatrix. It is dated some six months ago. Kindly read it, said Stanway coldly. With pleasure, the lawyer agreed, and he read it. Then as it turns out, Stanway remarked, looking defiantly at his uncle, Riley gets nothing but five pounds under this will. Under this will, nephew, the old man assented. And may one inquire... Stanway persisted, the nature of your intentions in regard to aunt's savings, which she leaves you to dispose of, according to your discretion? What does mean, nephew? Leonora saw with anxiety that her husband, while intended to be calm, pompous, and superior, was in fact losing control of himself. I mean, said John, are you going to distribute them? No, nephew, they're well enough where they lie. I shall not touch them. Stanway gave the sigh of a martyr who has sufficient spirit to be disdainful. Throwing his serviette on the disordered table, he pushed back his chair and stood up. You'll excuse me now, uncle, he said, bitterly polite. I must be off to the works. Riley, I shall want you. Without another word, he left the room and the house. Leonora was the last to go. Meshach would not allow her to stay after the tea things were washed up. He declined firmly every offer of help or companionship, and since the middle-aged servant made no objection to being alone with her convalescent master, Leonora could only submit to his wishes. When she was gone, he lighted his pipe. At seven o'clock the servant came into the parlour and found him dozing in the dark. His pipe hung loosely from his teeth. "Eh, hey, mister, he cried, lighting the gas, and you better go to bed, you've had a worrying day. Up and I better, 
he answered deliberately, taking hold of a pipe and adjusting his spectacles. Can ye undress yourself? he asked him. Aye, he said. I can do that, wench. A candle. And he went carefully up to bed. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 10 In the Garden. Father's in a horrid temper. Did anything go wrong? said Rose when Leonora reached Hillfold. No, Leonora replied. Where is he? In the drawing room. He says he won't have any tea. You must remember, my dear, that your father has been through a great deal this last day or two. So have all of us, as far as that goes, Rose stated ruthlessly. However, she turned away, shrugging her shoulders. Leonora wondered by means of what sad experience Rose would ultimately discover that, whereas men have the right to cry out when they are hurt, it is the whole business of a woman's life to suffer in cheerful silence. She sat with the girls during tea, drinking a cup for the sake of form, and giving them disconnected items and information about the funeral which at their own passionate request they had been excused from attending. The talk was carried on in low tones, so that the rattle of a spoon in a saucer sounded loud and distinct. And in the drawing-room, John steadily perused the signal, column by column, from the announcement of pink dominoes at the Hambridge Theatre Royal on the first page, to the bait of a sporting bookmaker in Holland at the end of the last. The evening was desolating, but Leonora endured it with philosophy, because she appreciated John's state of mind. It was the disclosure of the legacy of £250 to Fred Riley, and of the recent conditional revocation of that legacy, which had galled her husband's sensibilities, by bringing home to him what he had lost through Aunt Hannah's sudden death, and through the senile whim of Uncle Meshach to alter his will. He could well have tolerated Meechak's refusal to distribute Aunt Hannah's savings immediately, Leonora thought, had the old man's original testament remained uncancelled. Once upon a time, Riley, the despised poor relation, the offspring from an outcast of the family, was to have been put off with £250, and the bulk of the mired joint fortune was to have passed in any case to John. The withdrawal of the paltry legacy, as shown in the codicil, was the outward and irritating sign that Riley had been lifted from his humble position to the level of John himself. John, of course, had known months ago that he and Riley stood level in the hazard of gaining the inheritance, but the history of the legacy, revealed after the funeral, aroused his disgusted imagination as it had not been roused before. He was beaten, and more important, he knew it now. He had the incensed, futile, malevolent, devil-may-care feeling of being beaten. He bitterly invited fate not to stop at half-measures, but to come on and do her worst. And fate, with that mysterious responsiveness which often distinguishes her movements, came on. Of course I might have expected it, John exclaimed savagely two days later, when he received a circular to the effect that a small and desperate minority of shareholders were trying to put the famous brewery company into liquidation under the supervision of the court. The shares fell another five in twenty-four hours. The Burstley Conservative Club knew positively the same night that John had got out as a ruinous loss, and this episode seemed to give vigorous life to certain rumours, hitherto faint, that John and his uncle had violently quarrelled at his aunt's funeral, and that when Meshach died, Fred Riley would be found to be the heir. Other rumours, that Ethel Stanway and Fred Riley were about to be secretly married, that Day would have been the owner of Prince but for the difference between guineas and pounds, and that the real object of Arthur Twemlow's presence in the Five Towns was to buy up the concern of Twemlow and Stanway, were received with reserve, though not entirely discredited. The town, however, was more titillated than perturbed, for everyone said that old Meshach, for the sake of the family's good name, would never, under any circumstances, permit a catastrophe to occur. The town saw little of Meshach now. He had almost ceased to figure in the streets. It knew, however, the Mayat pride and the Mayat respectability. 
Leonora sympathised with John, but her sympathy, weakened by his surliness, was also limited by her ignorance of his real plight and by the secret preoccupation of her own existence. On the evening of the funeral, the desire to see Arthur again, to study his features, to hear his voice, definitely took the uppermost place in her mind. She thought of him always, and she ceased to pretend to herself that this was not so. She continually expected him to call, or to meet someone who had met him, or to receive a letter from him. She forced her memory to reconstitute in detail his last visit to Hillport, and all the exacerbating scene of the funeral feast, in order that she might dwell tenderly upon his gestures, his glances, his remarks, the inflections of his voice. The eyes of her soul were ever beholding his form. Even at breakfast, after the disappointment of the post, she would indulge in ridiculous hopes that he might be abroad very early and would look in. Not until bedtime did she cease to listen to his ring at the front door. No chance of a meeting was too remote for her wild fancy. But she dared not breathe his name, dared not even add umbrate an inquiry. And her husband and daughters appeared to have entered into a compact not to mention him. She did not take counsel with herself, examine herself, demand from herself what was the significance of these symptoms. She could not. She could only live from one moment to the next, engrossed in an eternal expectancy which, instead of slackening, became hourly more intense and painful. Towards the close of the afternoon of the third day, in the drawing-room, she whispered that something decisive must happen soon, soon. The bell rang. Her ears caught the distant sound for which they had so long waited. Shuddering, she thanked heaven that she was alone. She could hear the opening and closing of the front door. In three seconds, Bessie would appear. She heard the knob of the drawing-room door turn, and to hide her agitation, she glanced aside at the clock. It was a quarter to six. He will stay the evening, she thought. Mr. Dane, Bessie proclaimed. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Stanway? Stanway not coming yet, eh? said the stout boy, approaching her hurriedly with his fussy, awkward gait. She could have laughed, but the visit was at any rate a distraction. A few minutes later, John arrived. Dane will stay for tea, Nora, eh, Dane? he said. Oh, well, thanks, was Dane's reply. She asked herself with sudden misgiving what new thing was afoot. After tea, the two men were left together at the table. Mother, Ethel inquired eagerly, coming into the drawing room, why are Father and Mr. Dane measuring the dining room? I don't know, said Leonora. Are they? Yes, Mr. Dane has got ever such a long tape. Leonora went into the kitchen and talked to the cook. The next morning an idea occurred to her. Since the funeral, the girls had been down to see Uncle Meshach each afternoon, and Leonora had called at Church Street in the forenoon, so that the solitude of the old man might be broken at least twice a day. When she had suggested the arrangement to her husband, John had answered stiffly, with an unimpeachable righteousness, that everything possible must be done for his uncle. On this fourth day, Leonora sent Ethel and Minnie in the morning, with a message that she herself would come in the afternoon, by way of change. The phrase that sang in her head was Arthur's promise to Meshach. I shall call in a day or two. She knew that he had not yet called. Don't wait tea if I should be late, dears, she said smilingly to the girls. I may stay with Uncle a while. And she nearly ran out of the house. When they'd had tea, and when Leonora had performed the delicate feat of arranging Uncle Bishak's domestic affairs without affronting his servant, she sat down opposite to him before the fire in the parlour. You ever stopping a bit, eh? he said, as if surprised. Well, she laughed, wouldn't you like me to? Oh, aye, he admitted readily. I just like it well enough. I don't know but what you're all on be a very good, you and the wenches, and bread as causing of nights. But it's all one to me, I reckon. Take no pleasure in life. Nay, he went on. It isn't because of her. I've felt as I was done for for months past. I must just drag on. Don't talk like that, Uncle. She tried conventionally to cheer him. You must rouse yourself. What for? He's not a good answer to this conundrum. For all of us, she said lamely at length. Be an me, lass, he remarked dryly. You're no better than the rest of them. And as she sat there in the age-worn parlour, 
and thought of the distant days of his energy, when with his own hands he had pulled down a wall and replaced it by a glass partition, and of the night when he lay like a corpse on Ethel's bed at the mercy of his nephew, and of Aunt Hannah resting in the cold tomb just at the end of the street. Her heart was filled for a moment with an awful, ineffable, devastating sadness. It seemed to her that every grief, anxiety, apprehension, was joy itself compared to this supreme tragedy of natural decay. Shall I light the gas? she suggested. The room was always obscure, and that evening happened to be a sombre one. Aye. There, she said brightly when the gas flared. That's better, isn't it? Aren't you going to smoke? Aye. In reaching a second spill from the spill jar on the mantelpiece, she noticed the clock. It was only a quarter past five. He may call yet, she dreamed, and then a more piquant thought. He may be at home when I get back. There was a perfunctory knock at the house door. She started. It's the signal, lad, he shack explained. He keeps on bringing it, but I never look at it. She went into the lobby for the paper and then read aloud to Uncle Meshach the items of local news. The clock showed a quarter to six. Suddenly it struck her that Arthur Tremlow might have called quite early in the afternoon, and that Meshach might have forgotten to tell her. If he had perchance called, and perchance informed Meshach that he was going on to Hillport, and if he had walked up by the road when she came down by the fields, the idea was too dreadful. "'Has Mr. Tremlow been to see you yet?' she demanded, after a long silence, pretending to be interested in the signal. No, said Meshach. Why dost ask? I remembered he said he should. He'll come, he'll come, Meshach murmured confidently. They ain't been in, he added. Be papers to sign, probate or Hannah's will. Seemingly John's not satisfied from what Dane hints. Not satisfied with what? Flushing a little, she dropped the paper, but she was still busily employed in expecting Arthur to arrive. Eh, hey, I cannot tell you, lass. Meshack gave a grim sigh. You know, as I altered my will. Jack mentioned it. Me and her, we thought it over. It was her at first said that Fred was getting a nice young chap, and very respectable, and why should he be left out in the cold? And so I says to her, I says, Well, you can make your will in favour of Fred, if you've a mind. Nay, Meshack, her says. Never ask me to cut out our John's name. Well, I says to her, if you won't, I will. It'll give them both an even chance. Mustn't I pretty near together, me and you, Anna? It'll be a toss-up, I says. Wasn't that fair? Leonora made no reply. Wasn't that fair? He repeated. She could not be sure, even then, whether Uncle Meshach had devised in perfect seriousness this extraordinary arrangement for dealing justly between the surviving members of the Mayite family, or whether he had always had a private humorous appreciation of the fantastic element in it. I don't know, she said. Well, lass, he continued persuasively sitting up in his chair, us ignored young Fred for more till twenty year, and it wasn't right. Anna said it wasn't right as Fred should suffer for his mother and his grandfather. And then us give Fred and your John an equal chance, and John's lost. And now John isn't satisfied by all accounts. She gazed at him with a gentle smile. Why doesn't thou speak, lass? What am I to say, uncle? Would like me to make a new will, and halve it between John and Fred? It wouldn't be fair to Fred, not rightly fair, because he's run his risk for the lot. And would you like it, lass? There was a trace of the old vitality in his shriveled features, as he laid this offering on the altar of her feminine charm. Oh, do, uncle, he was about to say eagerly. She thought in the same instant of John standing over Meshach's body, with the ice-cold cloth in his hand, and something... Some dim instinct of a fundamental propriety prevented her from uttering those words. I would like you to do whatever you think right, she answered with calmness. Meshack was obviously disappointed. I shall see, he ejaculated, and after a pause. John's in smooth water again, isn't he? I meant to ask, Dane. I think so, said Leonora. She had become restive. Soon afterwards she bade him good-night, and departed, and all the way up to Hillport she speculated upon the chances of finding Arthur in her drawing-room when she got home. As she passed through the hall, 
She knew at once that Arthur was not in the house and had not been there. And the agitation of her heart subsided suddenly into the melancholy stillness of defeated hope. She sadly admitted that she no longer knew herself and that the Leonora of old had been supplanted by a creature of incalculable moods, a feeble victim of strange crises of secret folly. Through the open door of the drawing room she could see Rose reading and Millicent searching among a pile of music on the piano. Bessie emerged from the dining room with a white cloth and the crumb tray. Master's in there, said Bessie. They didn't wait tea, ma'am. Leonora went into the dining room, but John sat alone at the bare mahogany, smoking. With her deep knowledge of him, she detected instantly that he had been annoyed by her absence from tea. The condition of the sharp end of his cigar showed that he was perturbed, fretful, and perhaps in a state of suspense. Well, he thought with resignation, I may as well play the wife. And she sat down in a chair near him, put her purse on the table, and smiled generously. Then she raised her veil, loosed the buttons of her new black coat, and began to draw off her gloves. I've been waiting for you, he said. To her surprise, his tone was extremely pacific. Have you? she answered, intensifying all her alluring grace. I hurried home. Yes, I wanted to ask you. He stopped, ostensibly to put the cigar into his meerschaum holder. She perceived that the desire to ingratiate fought within him against his vexation, and she wondered, with a touch of cynicism, what new scheme had got possession of him, and how her assistance was necessary to it. Would you like to go and live in the country, Nora? He looked at her audaciously for a few moments, and then his eyes shifted. For the summer, you mean? Yes, he said. For the summer, and the winter too. Summer out Snaid way. And leave here? Exactly. But what about the house, Jack? Most edit, if you like, said John lightly. Oh, no, I shouldn't like that at all, she replied, nervously but amiably. She wished to believe that his suggestion about selling the house was merely an idle notion thrown out on the spur of the moment, but she could not. He wouldn't? She shook her head. What has made you think of going to live in the country? she asked him, using a tone of gentle, mild curiosity. How should you get to the works in the morning? There's a very good train service from Snade tonight, he said. But look here, Nora, why wouldn't you care to sell the house? It was perfectly clear to her that, having mortgaged her house, he now made up his mind to sell it. He must therefore still be in financial difficulties, and she had unwittingly misled Uncle Meshack. I don't know, she answered coldly. I can't explain to you why, but I shouldn't. And she privately resolved that nothing should induce her to assent to this monstrous proposal. Her heart hardened to steel. She felt prepared to suffer any unpleasantness any indignity, rather than give way. "'Tisn't as if Hillport wasn't changing,' he went on, politely argumentative. "'It is changing. Another ten years, all the decent estates will have been broken up, and we should be left alone in the middle of streets of villas rented at nineteen guineas to escape the house duty. You know the sort of thing. And I've had a very fair offer for the place. Who from? Well, Dane. I know he's wanted the house a long time. Of course, he's a hard nut to crack his stain, but he went up to two thousand. Yesterday I got him to make it guineas. Good price, Nora. Is it? she exclaimed absently. I should just imagine it was, said John. So it was expected of her that she should surrender her home, her domain, her kingdom, the beautiful and mellow creation of her intelligence, and that she should surrender it to David Dane, and to the impossible Mrs. Dane, and to their impossible niece. She remembered one of Minnie's wicked tales about Mrs. Dane and the niece. Minnie had met Mrs. Dane in the street, and in response to an inquiry about the health of the hypochondriacal niece, Mrs. Dane, gorgeously attired, had replied, I'd have but just rallied up off the scrub as I come out. These were the people who wanted to evict her from her house, and they would cover its walls with new papers and its floors with new carpets in their own appalling taste, and they would crowd the rooms with furniture as fat clumsy and disgusting as themselves. And Mrs. Dane would hold sewing meetings in the drawing room and would stand chatting with tradesmen at the front door and would drive out to Sned to play a call on Leonora 
tell her how pleased they all were with the place. Do you absolutely need the money, John? He came to the point with a frank, blunt directness which angered him. I don't absolutely need anything, he retorted, throwing himself. But Dave made the offer. Because if you do, he proceeded, I dare say Uncle Meshach... Look here, my girl, he interrupted in turn. I've had exactly as much of Uncle Meshach as I can stand. I know all about Uncle Meshach. What I wanted to know was whether you cared to sell the house. Then he added, after hesitating, and with a false graciousness, to oblige me. There was a marked pause. I really shouldn't like to sell the house, John, she answered quietly. It was answered. Enough said, enough said, he cried. That finishes it. I suppose you don't mind my having asked you. He walked out of the room in a rage. Tears came into her eyes, the tears of a wounded and proud heart. Was it conceivable that he expected her to be willing to sell her house? He must indeed be in serious straits. She would consult Uncle Bishak. The front door banged, and then Rose entered the room. Leonora drove back the tears. Your father has been suggesting that we sell this house and go and live at Snade, she said to the girl in a trembling voice. Aren't you surprised? She seldom talked about John to her daughters, but at that moment a desire for sympathy overwhelmed her. I should never be surprised at anything where father was concerned, said Rose coldly, with a slight hint of aloofness and of mental superiority. Not at anything. Leonora got up and, leaving the room, went into the garden through the side door opposite the stable. She could hear Millicent practising the jewel song from Who Knows Faust. As she passed down the summer garden, the sound of the piano and of Millie's voice in the brilliant, ecstatic phases of the song grew fainter. She shook violently, like a child who is recovering from a fit of sobs. Without thinking, she fastened her coat. What a shame it is that he should want to sell my house. What a shame, she murmured, full of an aggrieved resentment. At the same time, she was surprised to find herself so suddenly and so deeply disturbed. At the foot of the long garden was a low fence separating it from the meadow, and in the fence a wicket from which ran a faint track to the main field path. She leaned against the fence a few yards away from the wicket, at a spot where a clump of bushes screened the house. No one could possibly have seen her from the house, even had the bushes not been there. But she wished to isolate herself completely, and to find tranquillity in the isolation. The calm spring night, chill but not too cold, cloudy but not too dark, favoured her intention. She gazed about her at the obscure nocturnal forms of things, at the silent trees, and the mysterious clouds gently rounded in their vast shape, and the sharp slant of the meadow. Far below could be seen the red signal of the railway, and, mapped in points of light on the opposite slope, the streets of Bursley. To the right, the eternal conflagration of the cauldron bar furnaces illumined the sky with wavering amber. And on the keen air came to her from the distance noises, soft but impressive, of immense industrial activities. She thought she could decipher a figure moving from the field path across the gloom of the meadow, and as she strained her eyes, the figure became an indutable fact. Presently, she knew that it was Arthur. At last, her heart passionately exclaimed, and she was swept and drenched with happiness as a ship by the ocean. She forgot everything in the tremendous shock of joy. She felt as though she could have waited no more, and that now she might expire in a bliss intense and fatal, in a sign of supreme content. She could not stir, nor speak, and he was striding towards the wicked, unconscious of her nearness. She coughed, a delicate feminine cough. And then he turned aside from the direction of the wicket and approached the fence, peering. Is that you? he asked. Yes. Across the fence they clasped hands. And in spite of her great wish not to do so, she clutched his hand tightly in her long fingers and held it for a moment. And as she felt the returning pressure of his large, powerful, protective grasp, he covered 
but in imagination only. She covered his face, which she could shadowly see, with brave and abandoned kisses. And she whispered to him, but unheard, Admit that I am made for love. She feared in those beautiful and shameless instants neither John, nor Ethel, and Millie, not even Rose. She knew suddenly why men and women leave all, honour, duty, and affection, and follow love. Then her arm dropped, and there was silence. What are you doing here? She was unable to speak in an ordinary tone, but she spoke. Her voice exquisitely trembled, and its vibrations said everything that the words did not say. Why? he answered, and his voice too bore strange messages. I called at Church Street, and Mr. Mard said you had only been gone a few minutes, and so I came right away. I guessed I should overtake you. I don't know what he would think. Arthur laughed nervously. She smiled at him, satisfied. And how well she knew that her smiling face, caught by him dimly in the obscurity of the night, troubled him like an enchanting and enigmatic vision. After they had looked at each other, speechless, for a while, the strong influence of convention forced them again into unnecessary, irrelevant talk. What's this about you selling this place? he inquired in a low, mild affair. Have you heard? Oh, yes, he said. I, I did hear something. Ah, she murmured, wrinkling her forehead in a pretty make-believe of woe. The question of the sale had ceased to be acute. I just came out here to think about it. But you aren't really going to? No, of course not. She had no desire to discuss the tedious affair, because she was infallibly certain of his entire sympathy. Explanations on her side and assurances on his were equally superfluous. But uh, won't you come into the house? She invited him as a sort of afterthought. Why? he demanded bluntly. She hesitated before replying. It would look so queer, us standing here like this. As soon as she had uttered the words, she suspected that she had said something decisive and irretrievable. He put his hands into the pockets of his overcoat and walked several times to and fro a few paces. Then he stopped in front of her. I guess we are bound to look queer, you and I, some day. So it may as well be now, he said. It was in this exchange of sentences that their mutual passion became at length articulate. A single discreet word spoken quickly, and she might even yet perhaps have withdrawn from the situation. But she did not speak. She could not speak. And soon she knew that her own silence had bound her. She yielded herself with poignant and magnificent joy to the profound drama which had been magically created by this apparently commonplace drama. The climax had been achieved, and she was conscious of being lifted into a sublime exaltation and of being cut off from all else in the world save him. She looked at him intently the sadness that was the cloak of celestial rapture. How courageous you are, her soft eyes said. I should never have dared. What a man! It seemed to her that her heart would break under the strain of that ecstasy. She had not imagined the possibility of such bliss. Listen, he proceeded. I ought to be in New York. I oughtn't to be here. I must tell you, Scarcely a fortnight ago, one afternoon, while I was working in my office in 14th Street, I had a feeling I would be bound to come over. I said to myself, the idea was preposterous. The next thing I knew, I was arranging to come. I couldn't believe I was coming. Not even when I booked my berth and boarded the steamer, and not even when the steamer was actually passing Sandy Hook, could I believe that I was really coming. I said to myself I was mad. I said to myself that no man in his senses could behave as I was behaving. And when I got to Southampton, I said I would go right back. And yet I couldn't help getting into the special for London. And when I got to London, I said I would act sensibly and go back. But I met young Burgess, and the next thing I knew, I was at Euston. And here I am pretending that it's my new London branches that bring me over. I do business I don't want to do in Knipe and cold and adversely. And I'm kidding myself. Yes, I am. I tell you, I couldn't stand much more, and I wouldn't be sure I wasn't kidding you. 
Some folks would say the whole thing was perfectly dreadful. But I don't care so long as you, so long as you don't. I'm not conceited, really, but it looks like conceit. Me talking like this and assuming that you're ready to stand and listen. I assure you it isn't conceit. I, I only know, that's all. It's difficult for you to say anything, I can feel that. But I'd like you just to tell me you're glad I came and glad I've spoken. I'd just like to hear that. She gazed fondly at him. At the male creature in whom she could find only perfection. And she was filled with glorious pride that her image should have drawn this strong, shrewd, self-possessed man across the Atlantic. It was incredible, but it was true. And, said the secret feminine in her, why not? He waited for her answer facing him. Oh, yes, she breathed. Oh, yes. I'm glad. I'm so glad. I wish, he broke out, I wish I could explain to you what I think of you, what I feel about you. You're so hard and simple and direct, and yet you don't know it, but you are. You're, you're absolute to the most. Oh, it's no use. She saw that he was growing very excited, and this too gave her deep pleasure. We're in a hell of a fix, he sighed. Like many women, she took a fearful, almost thrilling joy in hearing a man swear earnestly and religiously. That's it, he said. There's nothing to be done. Nothing to be done, he demanded imperiously. Nothing to be done. He examined his face, which was close to hers, with a meditative, expectant smile. She loved to see him out of repose, eager, masterful and daring. What is there to be done? she asked. I don't know yet, he said firmly. I must think. Then, in a delicious surrender, she felt towards him as though they were on the brink of a rushing river, and he was about to pick her up in his arms like a trifle and carry her safely through the flood, and she had the illusion of pressing her face, which she knew he adored, against his shoulder. Oh, you innocent angel, he cried, seizing her hand. She let it lie in her. Do you suppose I'm the sort of man to sit down and cross my legs and say that fate, or whatever you call it, hasn't done me right? Do you suppose that two sensible persons like you and me are going to be beaten by a mere set of circumstances? We aren't children, we aren't fools. But you're not afraid, are you? She drank in her charm. What of? Anything. It's when you aren't there, she murmured tenderly. She really thought then that by some marvellous plan he would perform the impossible feat of reconciling the duty of fulfilling love with all the other duties. I shall wreck it up, he said. Ah. Silence fell. And with the feel of the grass under her feet and the soft clouds overhead and the patient trees and the glare and the sudden smoke and the lamps of Bursley and the solitary red signal in the valley, she breathed out her spirit like an aerial essence merged into unity with him. And the strange, far-off noises of nocturnal industry wandered faintly across the void and seemed fraught with a mysterious significance. Everything in that unique hour had the same mysterious significance. Mother! Millicent's distant voice, fresh and strong and pure in the night, chanted the words startlingly to the first notes of a phrase from the dual song. Mother, aren't you coming in? The girl finished the phrase with inviting gaiety, holding the final syllable. And the sound faded, went out, like the flare of a rocket in the sky, and the dark stillness was emphasised. They did not move, they did not speak, but Leonora pressed his hand. The passing thought of the orderly, multifarious existence of the house behind her of the warmed and lighted rooms, of the preoccupied lives, only increased the felicity of her halcyon dream. And in the dreamy and brooding silence, all things retreated and gradually lapsed away, and the pair was left sole amid the ineffable spaces of the universe to listen to the irregular beatings of their own hearts. Time itself had paused. Mother! Millicent sang again, nearer, more strongly, purely in the night. We are waiting for you to come in. 
She varied a little the phrase from the jewel song. To come in. The long sustained note seemed to become a beautiful warning, and then the sound expired. Leonora withdrew her hand. I shall think it out and write to you tomorrow, Arthur whispered, and was gone. The next day, after a futile morning of hesitations, Leonora decided in the afternoon that she would go out for a walk and return in some definite state of mind. She loosed Bran, and the dog, when he had finished his elephantine gambards, followed her close at heel with all stateliness to the wide marsh on the brow of the hill. Here she began actively and seriously to cogitate. John was sulking, and it was seldom that he sulked. He had not spoken to her again, neither on the previous evening nor at breakfast. He had said nothing whatever to anyone, except to tell Bessie that he should not be at home for dinner. On committee meeting days, when he was engaged at the town hall, John sometimes dined at the Tiger. His attitude produced a small effect on Leonora. She was far too completely absorbed in herself to be perturbed by the offensive symptoms of her husband's wrath. She had neglected even to call on Uncle Meshach, and as she strolled about the marsh, she thought vaguely and perfunctorily that she must see Uncle Meshach soon and acquaint him with John's difficulties. Pride, as much as joy and alarm, filled her heart. She was proud of her perilous love. She would have liked proudly to confide it to some friend, some mature and brilliant woman who knew the world and understood things and who would talk rationally. It seemed to her that this secret idyll, at once tender and sincere and rather dashing, was worthy of pride. She knew that many women, languishing in the greyness of an impeccable and frigid domesticity, would be capable of envying her. She remembered that, in reading the newspapers, she had sometimes timidly envied the heroines of the matrimonial court who had bought romance at the price of esteem and of peace. Then, suddenly, the whole matter slipped into unreality, and she could not credit it. Was it possible that she, a respectable matron, a known figure, the mother of adult daughters, had fallen in love with a man not her husband, had had a secret interview with her lover, and was anticipating not a retreat, but an advance? And he thought, as every honest woman has thought in like case, this may happen to others. One hears of it, one reads about it. But surely it cannot have happened to me. And when she had admitted that it in fact had happened to her, and had perceived with a kind of shock that the heroines of the matrimonial court were real persons, everyday creatures of flesh and blood, she thought again like the rest, Ah, oh, but my affair is different from all the others. There is something in it, something indefinable and precious, which makes it different. She said, can one help falling in love? Can one be blamed for that? For John, she had little compassion, and the gay and feverish existence of New York spread out invitingly before her in a vision full of piquant contrasts with the death in life of the five towns. But her beloved girls, they were an insuperable barrier. She could not leave them. She could not forfeit the right to look them in the eyes without embarrassment. And then, the next moment, somehow she did not know how. The difficulty of the girls was arranged. And she had departed. She had left the five towns forever. And she was in the train, in the hotel, on the steamer. She saw every detail of the escape. Oh, the rapture, the tremors, the long sigh, the surrender, the intense living. Surely no price could be too great. No. Common sense, the acquirement of forty years, supervened and informed her wild heart with all the cold arrogance of sagacity that these imaginings were vain. She felt that she must write a brief and firm letter to Arthur and tell him to desist. She saw with extraordinary clearness that this course was inevitable, and lest her resolution might slacken, she turned instantly towards home and began to hurry. The dog glanced up questioningly and hurried too. Why, she reflected, people would say, and her husband's aunt scarcely cold in her grave. She laughed scornfully. A carriage overtook her. It was Mrs. Dane, coming from the direction of Oldcastle. Good afternoon to you, Mrs. Dane shouted without stopping, 
and then when she caught sight of Bran, Bless us, the dog hasn't broken his leg after all. Broken his leg? Leonora repeated, astonished. The carriage was now in front of her. Now Polly come in this morning and sat herself down on a chair and told us that your dog had broken his leg. What tails one airs? Mrs. Dane had to twist her stout neck dangerously in order to finish the sentence. I should think so, was Leonora's private comment, her gaze fixed on the scarlet of Mrs. Dane's nodding bonnet. In the little room of the dining room, Leonora dipped pen in ink to write to Arthur. She wrote the date, and she wrote the word, Dear, and she could not proceed. She knew that she could not compose a letter which would be effective. She went to the window and looked out, biting the pen. What am I to do? she whispered in terror. What am I to do? Then she saw Ethel running hard down the drive to the front door. Oh, mother! The pale girl burst into the room. Father's done something to himself. Fred's come up. They're bringing him. John Stanway had called at the chemist's in the marketplace and had given a circumstantial description of an accident to Bran. It appeared that while Carpenter was washing the wagonette, Bran being loose in the stable yard, the groom had suddenly slipped the lever of the carriage jack, and the oft hind wheel had caught Bran's hind leg and snapped it like a piece of wood. The chemist had suggested prussic acid, and John had laughingly answered that perhaps the chemist would be good enough to come up and show them how to administer prussic acid to a dog of Bran's size in great pain. John explained that the animal was now fast by the collar, and he demanded a large dose of morphia together with a hypodermic instrument. Having obtained these and precise instructions for their use, John had hurried away. It was not till three hours had elapsed that a startling suspicion had disturbed the chemist's easy mind. By that time, the preparations completed, John had dropped unconscious from the armchair in his office of the works, and Bursley was provided with one of those morbid sensations which more than joy or triumph electrify the stagnant passes of a provincial town. Scores of persons followed the cab which conveyed Stanway from the works to his house, and on the route most of the inhabitants seemed to know in advance by some strange intuition that the vehicle was coming, and at their windows or at their gates, according to social status, they stood ready to watch it pass. And even after John had entered his home and been carried upstairs, and the cab and the policeman had gone, and the doctor had gone, and Fred Riley and Mr Mayor, the works manager, had gone, the crowd still remained on the footpath, staring at the gravel drive and at the front door, silent, patient, implacable. The doctor had tried hot coffee, artificial respiration, and other remedies, but without the least success, and he had reluctantly departed, solemn for once, leaving four women to understand that there was nothing to do save to wait for the final sign. The inactivity was dreadful for them. They could only look at each other and think and move to and fro aimlessly in the large bedroom and light the gas at dusk and examine from moment to moment those contracted pupils and that damp white brow and listen for the faint occasional breath. They did not think the thoughts which, could they have foreseen the situation, they might have expected to think. It did not occur to them to search for the causes of the disaster, nor to speculate upon its results in regard to themselves. They surrendered to the supreme fact. They were all incapable of logic and ordered reflections, and in the hushed torpor of their secret hearts there wandered, loosely, little disconnected ideas and sensations, as that the Stanway family was at length getting its full share of vicissitude and misfortune, that John was, after all, more important and more truly dominant and more intimately a part of their lives than they had imagined that this affair was a thousand miles removed from that of Uncle Meshach, that they were fully supplied with mourning, and that suicide was mysteriously different from their previous notion of it. The impressive thoughts, the obvious thought, that if their creeds were sound, a soul was about to enter into eternal torment, and that their lives would be violently changed, and that they would be branded before the world as the wife and the daughters of a defaulter and a self-murderer, did not by any means absorb their minds in those first hours. In the attitude of the girls towards Leonora, there was a sort of religious deference as of priestesses to one soon to be sacrificed. She is the central figure of the tragedy, 
they had the air of saying to each other. We feel the affliction, but it cannot be demanded from us that we should feel it as she feels it. We are only beginning to live. We have the future. But she, she will have nothing. She will be the widow. And the significance of that terrible word, all that it implied of social diminishment, of feeding on memory and of mere waiting for death, seemed to cling about Leonora as she stood, restlessly observant by the bed. And when Rose urged her to drink some tea, she could not help drinking the tea humbly, from a fair sense of the duty of doing what she was told. It was not Rose's fault that Rose was superior, and that only twenty-four hours ago she had coldly informed her mother that no act of her father's would surprise her. Leonora resigned herself to humility. Mamma, said Vincent, peeping into the room after an absence, Uncle Meshach is here with Mr. Tremblow, and he says he's coming in. Must he? Of course, darling, Leonora answered without turning her head. Uncle Meshach appeared, leaning on his stick and on Arthur's arm. He wore his overcoat and even his hat, and a white-knitted muffler encircled his shriveled neck in loose folds. No one spoke. The old and feeble man, with short, uncertain steps, drew Arthur towards the bed and gazed at his dying nephew. Meshach looked long and sighed. Suddenly he demanded of Leonora in a whisper, Is he unconscious? Drawing a little nearer to the bed, Meshach signed to Millicent to approach and gave her his stick. Then he unbuttoned his overcoat and his coat and the flap pocket of his trousers, and after much searching found a box of matches. He shook out a match clumsily and struck it and came still nearer to the bed. All wondered apprehensively what the old man was going to do, but none dared interfere or protest because he was so old and so precariously attached to life and because he was the head of the family. With his thin, veined, trembling hand, he passed the lighted match close across John's eyeballs. Not a muscle twitched. Then he extinguished the match, put it in the box, returned the box to his pocket, and buttoned the pocket and his coat. Aye, he breathed. The lad's unconscious, right enough. Let's be going. Taking his stick from Minnie, he touched Arthur's arm again, and very slowly left the room. After a moment's hesitation, Leonora followed and overtook them at the bottom of the stairs. It was the first time she had forsaken the bedside. She was surprised to see Fred Riley in the hall, self-conscious but apparently determined to be quite at home. She remembered that he said he should come up again as soon as he had arranged matters at the work. Just take Mr. Meyer to the cab, will you? His friend there parted to Fred. I'll follow. Certainly, Fred agreed, pulling his moustache nervously. Now, Mr. Martin, let me help you. Aye, said Meshach. Thou shalt help me a thou a mind. As he was feeling for the step with his stick, he stopped and looked round at Leonora. Lass, he exclaimed, thou told me John was his smooth water. And he departed, and they could hear his shuffling steps on the gravel. Tremor glanced inquiringly at Leonora. Come in here, she said briefly, pointing to the drawing room. They entered. Stark. Your uncle made me drive up with him, Arthur explained, as if in apology. She ignored the remark. You must go back to New York at once, she told him, in a dry, curt voice. Yes, he assented. I suppose I'd better. And don't write to me until after I have written. Oh, but, he began. She thought wildly. This man, with his reason and his judgment, has not the slightest notion how I feel, not the slightest. I must write, he said in a persuasive tone. No, she cried passionately and vehemently. You aren't to write, and you aren't to see me. You must promise, absolutely. For how long? he answered. She shook her head. I don't know. I can't tell. But isn't that rather? Will you promise? He cried once more, quite loudly and almost fiercely. And her accents were so full of entreaty, of command and of despair that Arthur feared a nervous crisis for her. If you wish it, he said, forced to yield. And even then she could not be content. 
You give me your word to do nothing at all until you hear from me? He paused, but he saw no alternative to submission. Yes. She thanked him, and without shaking hands or saying good night, she went upstairs and resumed her place by the bedside. She could hear Uncle Meshach's cab drive away. How came Mr. Twemlow to be here, Mother? Rose demanded quietly. I don't know, Leonora replied. He must have been at Uncle's. When the doctor had been again and gone, and various neighbours and the signal reporter had called to inquire for news, and the hour was growing late, Ethel said to her mother, Fred thinks he had better stay all night. But why? Leonora asked. Well, mother, said Minnie, it's just as well to have a man in the house. He can rest on the Chesterfield in the drawing room, Ethel added. Then if he's wanted. Yes, yes, Leonora agreed, and tell him he's very kind. At midnight, Fred was reading in the drawing room, the man in the house, the ultimate front of security for seven women. Bessie, having refused positively to go to bed, slept in a chair in the kitchen, her heels touching the scrap of hearthrug which lay like a little island on the red tiles in front of the range. Rose and Millicent had retired to bed about three o'clock. Ethel, as the eldest, stayed with her mother. When the hall clock sounded one, meaning half past twelve, Leonora glanced at her daughter, who reclined on the sofa at the foot of the beds. The girl had fallen into a doze. John's condition was unchanged. The doctor had said that he might possibly survive for many hours. He lay on his back with open eyes and damp face and hair. His arms rested inert on the sheet. And underneath that thin covering, his chest rose and fell from time to time with a scarcely perceptible movement. It seemed to Leonora that she could realise now what had happened and what was to happen. In the nocturnal solemnity of the house, filled with sleeping and quiescent youth, she, who was so mature and so satiate, had the sensation of being alone with her mate. Images of Arthur Twemlow did not distract her. With the full strength of her mind, she had shut an iron door on the episode in the garden. It was as though it had never existed. And she gazed at John with calm and sad compassion. I would not sell my home, she reflected, and here is the consequence of refusal. She wished she had yielded, and she could perceive how unimportant comparatively bricks and mortar might be. But she did not blame herself for not having yielded. She merely regretted her sensitive obstinacy as a misfortune for both of them. She had a vision of humanity in a hurried procession, driven along by some force unseen and ruthless, a procession in which the grotesque and the pitiable were always occurring. She thought of John standing over Meshach with the cold towel, and of Meshach passing the flame across John's dying eyes. And these juxtapositions appeared to her intolerably mournful in their ridiculous grimness. Impelled by a physical curiosity, she lifted the sheet and scrutinised John's breasts, so padded against the dark red of his neck and bent down to catch the last tired efforts of the heart within. And the idea of her extraordinary intimacy with this man, of the incessant familiarity of more than twenty years, struck her and overwhelmed her. She saw that nothing is so subtly influential as constant, uninterrupted familiarity, nothing so binding, and perhaps nothing so sacred. It was a trifle that they had not loved, they had lived. Ah, she knew him so profoundly that words could not describe her knowing him. He kept his own secrets, hundreds of them, and he had in a way astounded and shocked her by his suicide. Yet in another way this miserable termination did not at all surprise her, and his secrets were petty, factual things of no essential import, which left her mystic omniscience of him unimpaired. She looked at his eyes, and thought pitifully, These eyes cannot see that I uncover him. Then she looked again at his breast, which heaved in shallow respirations. And at the moment he exhaled a sigh, so softly delicate and gentle, 
that it might have been the sigh of an infant sinking to sleep. She put her ear quickly to the still breast, as to a seashell, and listened intently, and caught no rumour of life there. Startled, she glanced at the jaw which had dropped, and then at Ethel dozing on the sofa. The room was filled for her with the majestic sound of trumpets, loud, sustained, and thrilling, but heard only by the soul. A noble and triumphant fanfare announcing the awful advent of those forces which are beyond the earthly sense. John's body lay suddenly deserted and residual. That deceitful brain, and that lying tongue, and that murderous hand had already begun to decay and the informing fragment of eternal and universal energy was gone to its next manifestation and its next task, unconscious, irresponsible, and unchanged. The ineptitude of human judgments had been once more emphasised and the great excellence of charity. Ethel, said Leonora timorously, waking with a touch the young and beautiful girl whose flushed cheek was pressed against the cushion of the sofa, He's gone. Call Fred. End of chapter 10